Recording in progress. <laughs> Your makeup looks so good. Thank you. I don't usually actually do. Th thank you for saying that. I don't usually actually do a lot of makeup, but um, I, I was just doing it, and one thing led to another, and then I was like, maybe because I used to. I, I took a makeup class back in college. Oh, that's how you got those wings. I could never get the wings. Practicing. <laughs> I've been like, because I no in theater we never had to do any kind of like actual makeup. We just did like theater makeup. And I was really good at it. And so I miss being able to like contour, but now I don't really remember how. So I was just playing around with it after I did my wings. Then I was like, well, maybe I can contour. So thank you. I just think so. I want to take a screenshot. Do what? I want to take a screenshot. Okay. <laughs> I remember this. Yes. I don't even know how to do that, actually. Um, mine is shift command three. I wonder what mine is. Shift? That's how my because I'm on the computer. I don't know if you're on your phone or your computer. I don't know. My, this whole thing is actually recording. So um and I records video too. I've just never used it. Um so but if you don't care, I might could use it on something like uh promoting. Yeah. So you're I, yeah, you can record the video. It records well, it automatically does it. I've just never used the video because yeah, this is an audio and most people are like, Oh, I'm not dressed for a video, and I'm like, okay, I won't use it. Um, you said you weren't doing videos, so I might want to put a shirt on. <laughs> oh, it should no, get what it's okay. you look fine, but whatever you want to do, it it does it automatically. Like it records the video. I just like it just goes into a file, and then I don't do anything with it. Um, but anyway, uh, thanks for being here. <laughs> thanks for having me. Yes, yes. Um, I've actually been listening to your music and watching your videos all day. That is so cool. Yes. Um, well, I, you know, what's funny, my, um, so I have a partner and I was telling him, like, he knew I was going to interview someone today and he knew their name was Aviva and that's all he knew. And then I was watching something of yours and I, I showed it to him and he was like, wait, this, this is Aviva from Flying Back. I'm like, yeah. And he was like, she's like famous. It's like, oh, okay. Well, cool. <laughs> so it always makes me laugh when people say I'm famous. Everybody knows who she is. I was like, oh, okay. I mean, I know who you are, but I didn't. I I didn't know you're famous. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny. I actually don't remember because we're friends on Facebook, but I don't know why. Like, I don't remember why. I think I just. <laughs> I was like Facebook but I don't remember like I think I probably just saw your Facebook and thought you were cool and was like ad um, or the other way around yeah maybe because I do accept people I used to not accept people I didn't know but now I add people like if I think they look interesting or if we if like we have a lot of mutual friends and I think that we should just be friends I just add people same and you know I only usually add people if they're like they have really positive posts like uplifting yeah. posts like yeah you know because it's it's so funny it's the worst when you add someone and then you realize like everything they post is either terrible or like political but I don't agree with like it's always you know the worst like uh because then you meet someone you think they're really cool and um then you're like, oh God, like you think that? Oh no. So it, anyway. it's, it's everyone. I just started to kind of look at it like, you know, a pimple or something that it's just like, well, that's what's on their face right now, but it might pop. And, you know, next year they might feel differently because we all change and it's okay. That's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> I love because that. I don't, you know, everyone I think is purely a soul. And everyone in like, you know, their spirit is just beautiful and gorgeous. And then these ego ideas that we get, they're ever changing. And I, I really try not to judge unless someone's being hateful to me personally. I try not to judge, but clearly I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like that. That's a good way of looking at it. Um, Cause you're right. People do change their minds and especially nowadays, I feel like people are open to with like, uh, TV, like TV is such a good way to get people to change their mind about things like TV shows, like, like, uh, like it's called programming. 
yeah and it works so i'm like if that's a great way to get people to change their mind and see people in a different light um mm -hmm. but anyway i was watching your videos today and what is the your videos about oh i'm gonna say it wrong the one you did today it's ki chong <laughs> I don't it, like, it was so close chi gong she got, I even wrote it down. I was like, I don't know how to pronounce that. What? What is that exactly? Well, everyone usually knows what Tai Chi is, but they don't know what Qigong is. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I, I could have Googled that instead of asking you. What Tai Chi is? Yeah, Tai Chi. Yeah, the slow. We did Tai Chi in theater school. We always had to do the Tai Chi, the which I don't remember now. But so, yeah. yeah, that's where I did a lot of it. But <laughs> Pardon me. I like... um cooked up kind of like an omelet with jalapeno peppers <laughs> and cayenne so it's like all in the air um but anyway um it's the mother of tai chi that's oh. how they describe it um chi means of course similar to what chi means in tai chi it's like energy essence i mean a lot of different things and gong is the study of it and tai is the movement of it so they say that you really should do qigong for years before you do the tai chi because you, oh there's my kitty cat because you could do the tai chi movements but not really feel the chi but to really really get in touch with what qigong is and how to really harness your energy and cultivate it before you do the tai chi it's kind of like you know the karate kid where you paint the house before you do the <laughs> right oh okay well that's interesting um, I I watched your facelift video and I did it. Wow! <laughs> the only thing I was missing was there wasn't to get rid of my double chin. I kept waiting for you to be like, and here, and you never did. And I was like, oh, dang, gum it, nothing's gonna. Oh, are you talking about the facelift one? Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. I'll have to do a double chin one. Yeah, because I hate my double chin. I like I'm trying to lose weight, but I think my is possible. But I think it comes from inflammation because sometimes it'll be like swollen right here. And I'm like, thyroid. yeah, thyroid stuff. But we actually did the biting, which really helps with that. Oh, it does. Oh, okay. Well, I'll have to do that more because I swear, like, it's not just fat. It's just some days I'll be like, that is really swollen right here. And other days I'm like, wow, it's, it's just a normal looking double chin. Yeah, oh. those your lymph nodes right there. And yeah, absolutely. Your, your intuition is spot on. And so, of course, the biggest thing that causes inflammation is sugar and high fructose corn syrup, and then and then is the white bread and, and all that stuff. So if you can well, cut that out or add more greens and lemon juice, that would help you. I do a lot. I do green smoothies every day. What? Yeah, I do them every day. Um, like, my goal was to eat two pounds of vegetables every day, but it's really hard. So usually... Usually I get it in about a pound of like with smoothies because I, I can't, I don't like salads. I hate them no matter what I try. I, I hate them, but I like smoothies. So yeah, I just, make, I'm obsessed with like romaine lettuce. And romaine is really good. My, my friend, I don't like salads. I don't like any kind of dressing that's good for you. The only dressing I like is ranch and like, it's just so fatty. And, um, I was, I was eating salads. Right, for there are healthy fats. I mean, you could. If if it's organic and it could be healthy, I I'm really into the um Primal Kitchen Caesar dressing. Okay, I have that one. I'll and that's it. that's totally what motivates me. Like I'll be like driving home from work and thinking about what I'm gonna eat for dinner. I'll be like a salad with dressing, and then I can put whatever I want in the salad as long as it has dressing. I will eat the whole thing. I'll eat like a bowl that big. Oh, I actually do like Caesar a salad with romaine. That is very good. It's like one of the only, I like ranch. I don't even really like ranch though on salads. I just like to dip everything in it. Oh, um, yeah. Like a dip, like sour cream. It's a, it's a dip more, more like, but anyway, I, I just do smoothies and I put fruit in it and I blend it up and I drink those and I'm trying to limit the sugar, but that's real. I'm like, I, every day I'm like, I'm not going to eat anything with sugar. And then I do. So it's like, that's my like downfall. Oh like it's not food it's a drug so if you start treating it like that then you'll realize the reason why I want this is because of my addiction so why do I have an addiction what emotions do I need to release oh that's that's yeah, I mean I sugar is like 
if I have anxiety or sadness, that is my go-to drug. I'm mm -hmm. pretty straight edge, but um, yeah, sugar, it, 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 it does something to make you less sad. <laughs> yeah. It releases endorphins. I th well, chocolate releases endorphins, I think. Yeah. So I make my own chocolate, which is like way healthier and I could give you the recipes and that's, that's a great way to do it. <laughs> How do you do that? What? How do you do that? It's super easy. You just buy like from Seven Ando or like a, a health food store, the cocoa butter, the edible cocoa butter uh -huh. when it's on sale, hopefully. And then you just add like a, a no sugar, organic, maybe vegan chocolate chip. Uh-huh. You basically can literally just put like uh, an oven safe container in the oven, melt the cocoa butter, and then add the uh, the chips. I have one of those like kind of espresso carafes. So I pour it all in there and then I pour it in molds and then I stick it in the fridge or the freezer and sometimes add Rice Krispies and there's my chocolate bars. Wow, that sounds amazing. And it's also super easy, easy to use like cupcake containers, like if you don't yeah. have molds. You know, it's funny. The only molds I have are shaped like bones. They're like <laughs> molds. That's, that's it. And then if I make like muffins, they're bone shaped. <laughs> <laughs> Give a dog a bone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you're not originally from Atlanta, are you? New York. That's, I thought you were from up north. How did you end up in Atlanta? I actually came to visit a friend. I was going to a drama school in New York City with her. Um, and I, it was a two-year program that I signed up for, the Marjorie Ballantyne Studio. I learned so much. And my favorite teacher um, was from England, Rada, that famous academy. And he was a Qigong teacher. And you know, he was just incredible. I just felt like he really broke into me and helped me get into characters and helped me do all kinds of emotional release, like expressions. And he wrote to me while he was in Atlanta and he's like, I'm not coming back. I just wanted you to know. Cause he, I guess he knew he was my favorite. And so I was like, you know what? I don't think I want to go back without him. No, no offense to Marjorie. He was just like over the top. And so I was like, well, let me feel out Atlanta. The other thing that happened in Atlanta is I started writing songs again and I hadn't done that um, for years. And I was like, well, maybe the muse is here. I, I just kind of gave up singing and I was like, you know, acting was never my first thing. It was always musical theater. Uh, sure, I'll do acting in movies, whatever. I enjoy it, but music is my first love. And I just gave that up thinking I'd have more of a chance acting. And then I actually was really getting into theatrical design in New York City, like apprenticing people, which I loved. Um, but singing is, is, is my life. And so tomorrow, um, this is perfect timing. I'm actually releasing the album that I wrote and recorded when I was 12 oh, on nice. Spotify. Cause it just reminds me like, that's who I was my whole life. I was just writing songs. That's what made me so happy and so in this energy, you know, in this goo. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and it was like, you know, it, it just makes me laugh so hard listening to 12-year-old me with a Long Island accent who is writing these really deep lyrics and I know she's in pain. They were like all about unrequited love with this one guy that she was in love with not all of them but most of them and I, the honesty just makes me laugh because it's like wow no no I mean yeah there are some pop stars that are kind of that honest but they usually have teams that edit things out yeah you don't really get that raw stuff that doesn't make sense but it makes so much sense at the same time today when I was doing my deep dive on you <laughs> you had posted one but to be honest I couldn't quite make out the words that you were singing very well yeah it's not a very good okay I tried but I love that you did that when I, I put the words in the description oh okay I, I love that you did that um when I was a kid I also wrote songs uh -huh. but I didn't know how to, well I I didn't know how to put them to music which mm -hmm. I that's still my problem I I play the piano and I sing but I have a very hard time 
if I come up with words, it's like, I don't have the, I have an ear, like I'm not tone deaf, but I have a very hard time putting the music to words. Like, I don't know why I can't, if I have a tune in my head, I can't find it on the piano. So I have to, I've written a few songs in my life and I have to do it at the same time. Yeah. Music and words or else I can't do it. Yeah. There's something like that with me too. Like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as I've I've developed, sure, but like that little girl, like that's all she did. She like did the piano and the words at the same time. Hey, kitty cat, you want to come up here? Um, loved your piano. I loved whatever song you were playing, like the music with it, the piano chords. I loved it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I liked a lot of your songs. Um, Real quick. No, she'll. You know, cats don't like being picked up. They'll come to you, but. Right. You just act like you don't want them and they'll be right with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really liked your hamburger patty song. I don't know, I'm going to perform that tomorrow. So I've got a few 420 gigs. I know that you're going to be up before then, but um, yeah. So tomorrow I'm singing at Nuts and Berries at 420 in Brookhaven. And they're the ones who inspired that song because they invited me to perform at... Um, their hamburger event so I was like well I gotta write a hamburger song what's so funny what's so funny is I actually eat meat but I love that song I was like it's so great it's such a great hamburger patty song um it was really great I don't remember so I used to work at Brookhaven um I worked at this place called Vera Pizzeria it's right there like on the strip where like a lot of restaurants are but I don't know where nuts and berries is where's that it's next to Super Jenny. It's like the same. They're interconnected. It's north of the um, Mellow Mushroom. That's right there on the corner. So you keep going. I do know now. And then it's also on the left. And it's right before Oglethorpe. Okay. So it's like in the, the like, there's like a shopping center, right? Or no? It's not in the shopping center. It's before the public's shopping center. Okay. Okay. I was just curious because I used to be in Brookhaven a lot, um, but mostly just on that one road that's got like a lot of restaurants. The road that I cannot think of the name, Dresden, Dresden. Yeah. That's um, that's the only place I really know about. And then sometimes there was like a shopping center that I would end up being around. Um, but that's cool. Um, and speaking of 420, I was going to ask you all about your hemp and cannabis activism. So is it hemp or cannabis or both? <laughs> you could join us, Scribbles. So it started out as just both because hemp didn't exist on its own when we started the activism. It was only federally defined recently, like in the past 10 years. Um, and it's because they wanted to be able to produce something without THC. And so they were like, okay, well, let's take as much THC out of this as possible so that there's no, they love to call it, the legislators love to call it bad players. Um, and so they federally defined it as less than 0.3% THC. And so then, you know, my whole thing was cannabis cars, cannabis fuel. That's how I started getting into it when I was a kid and I was like reading sassy magazine or whatever it was, there were a lot of articles on the oil spills and it would make me cry. So like the backstory is, is that I was kind of abandoned on a farm. I was wolfing and oh. um, my car was being borrowed by someone else. And so I was just stuck on this farm for a few days and the farmer and I were hanging out and he, um, passed me a joint and I was like no I don't smoke and he was like why it's not because it's illegal is it and I'm like no I don't care about that everyone smokes like it it's not really illegal like that doesn't even make sense I was like no but I'm on this like at the time I was on this like spiritual path and had all these kind of rules and one of them was just being completely straight edge which does feel great to me but I don't like rules anymore by the way FYI and so he was like well, you really need to know the history. Like, just because you don't smoke, like, I want you to know that we were once required as farmers to grow cannabis. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you need to look it up. So I was actually traveling back to New York after that situation. And I was Googling it on my mom's computer. 
and I found out that Henry Ford had created a car that was made of cannabis and ran on cannabis. And I was like, I have to write a song about this. I was getting ready to sing at a reggae festival. So I was like, well, let me kind of do like a reggae sound to it. And that's when I started the activism. I listened to that song today. I liked it. Thank you. Because I was also like, I never, I didn't know that, um, that hemp could be an oil or, or whatever. I didn't know that. Yeah. So he had um, the diesel cars. George Washington Carver is the grandfather of Key Murchie. So at the time, and this is what my documentary Hemp Demic is all about. I should have sent that to you, but it's like more than two hours. So brace yourself, but it flows pretty well. It's like watching a bunch of YouTube videos in a row, you know? Um, but basically George Washington Carver, Kemer G, uh, was at the same time as chemical industries, DuPont started to come into play as well. And they didn't want that competition. Um, but anyway, George Washington Carver found out all these ways to use plants for industry because his vision was that farmers need help. I mean, it's still true to this day. Farmers work so hard and it's so hard to not only profit, but to meet their, you know, needs, like to, to even break even. And that's why the government has so many subsidies for farmers, especially like the corn and the soy and, you know, what we're using for ethanol right now. So, you know, these legislators are just turning a blind eye when I'm in there. I'm being like, subsidize hemp. Hemp can do the same thing as corn and soy and like a hundred times better. And that's what they were doing. They were making hemp ethanol. They had Henry Ford, Henry Ford had 10,000 acres of hemp that he breeded specifically for ethanol in Dearborn, Michigan. And he fueled 40,000 vehicles a year. So that was four vehicles per acre of hemp. That Wow. Yeah, so if you have a friend, if you have three friends and you guys grow an acre of hemp, then you guys can fuel all of your cars if you only have one car each every year. That's really cool. Um, so how how how's the activ activism been going? Do you think it's um, do you think they're gonna legalize it soon? That's up to you know. I think it's in God's hands. To be honest, like I don't really think people have like as much control as we think they do like I think it's about all of us like I don't think these people like I don't like really thinking oh these people in power it's like because who put them there I mean yes they are there is a lot of bullying going on there but we've all created this reality on some level so it's about a mass consciousness mm -hmm. and it's about like literally if it's like a game of Othello it's like I could put a white piece over there even though the whole board was black and all of a sudden the whole board will flip to white. And what that white piece represents is belief. So like you've seen it like with programming, like easily if everyone's belief changes, mm -hmm. it's gonna happen. Like it's, it, it does take innovative people and people are trying to control the money and whatnot, but I, I don't know. I think it's what we really want will make it happen somehow. Yeah, I mean, I don't know who would be against, well, I don't know who could be against it. Like, I get some people are like, oh, weed is bad. But those people are very, like, rare. I mean, they're like the minority. And hemp is like a completely different, I mean, it's the same plant. But, like, who could be against that? Like, it's... Uh... Um, watch End the Prohibition in Georgia, and you'll see a lot of people against it. And you'll see what they oh. say. Oh, um, See, yeah, I guess I'm un uninformed of these things. I don't know. I, I mean, it's you go down to the Capitol and it's just this weird. It it it's a whole corporate mentality. Yeah. And so the corporations, I mean, you got to think of it like this: like we're not playing their game. We're just not. We're more free spirits, let's say, or just you know living life without having to, you know, think about repairing the roads and, and doing, you know, keeping everyone's lights on and all this infrastructure that they're concerned about. And so the corporations basically, you know, 
have this huge sway like okay you really need to do what we say because without us you know people are going to go crazy because they won't have fuel for their cars they won't have you know lights for their house they won't have gas like we're keeping everything going for you so you need to scratch our backs and you know don't bring in this competition because you know if we even make you know less you know a penny less per whatever we're going to lose millions of dollars you know so it's a lot of fear um and it's and, and it's a mentality of this is the structure this is the infrastructure versus free market and does free market really work and they really should know that it does free yeah. market does because when the settlers first came here i don't know if you know the original story of thanksgiving um well i don't know i'm not sure why don't you tell me <laughs> so, when the settlers first came here there was so many people who died of famine every year okay. and they basically started with this communistic kind of lifestyle like everyone has to do this you have to do this um and then finally one year they were like you know what why don't everyone just contribute what they want like we're not going to tell you what to grow just do whatever you can and if you want to share it that'd be great Something like that. That that's like totally like footnotes, and that was the first year that people didn't starve. Oh, and okay. That's why they had this big feast? See, I don't know. I was like, when you said that, I was like, I don't know. I mean, Native Americans were massacred. I'm not sure where the where the Thanksgiving was. Oh, um, yeah. And then it became this big like cultural appropriation thing with like you know turkeys. I don't even know if they had turkey. Um, oh. <laughs> it's just so weird I mean Bluebell like wanted to make a profit I guess but who knows I mean I wasn't there so e even that's hearsay but hey, yeah baby. I'm gonna see if I can show her to you oh she's so cute but anyway free market is the way I think I really believe in it and <sighs> we'll see you know I just think we got to do better, you know, like we don't really need to be drilling for fuel. Like we could really be growing it. I, I, I mean, I think that scares some people because they're like, well, you can't depend on the sun and the rain and, you know. What do you mean? I mean, not like you can depend on it. It's there. Yes. <laughs> See, that's like coming from love instead of fear. Oh, man. Yeah. Um. I don't know much about drilling for oil, but I do know that it's a limited resource. And, um, you know, if you grow something, it's limited, but you can keep regrow it. I mean. Well, I have a few major concerns. One is like, it takes so much energy to do it. So it just makes sense to me that it's like, well, hemp creates energy while you're growing it. The trichomes filter the air. The THC crystals, that's what like okay. the mama, you know, of course it's a lot of male plants when you're dealing with hemp and, you, but you still get a little bit of that crystals and the trichomes, they filter the air, they bring, they get carbon out of the atmosphere, the, the CO2, bring more oxygen, they clean the soil, hemp like literally sucks lead out of wow. the ground dioxin they're doing studies on that and so i've been meeting with the psc and being like or like testifying and then meeting with a couple of the members like the psc are the panel that kind of supposedly keeps georgia power in check and helps to deal with the coal ash ponds which is a huge issue that you know organizations like the sierra club is dealing with so i'm i've been talking to like tim eccles and being like hey we got to grow hemp around the coal ash ponds we got to fight to remediate all that stuff and so he's like, one day, one day, one day. And when Gary Black was agricultural commissioner, he was totally down. I was like, let's put it around the airport. That's the mouth of the Flint River. Everyone south of our airport is getting jet fuel in their water. So can we please put up a hemp barrier? And he was like, that's a great idea. Make it happen. It's just $50 an acre to grow it. No one's stopping you. I'm like, uh... He's like, maybe call some of those mining companies. They need tax uh, write-offs. I don't know what he said. Something like they need to do good things for the environment to make up, you know, the checks and balances. So there's a way. 
I'm just one person. I'm making a little wave, but I think if we create that movement together, yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I think a lot of things that are like really smart and like the right thing to do takes like the majority, the longest to realize. Like, and it takes like, like people like you to be like, hey, hey, look over here. We need this. And then eventually people will start listening and paying attention and be like, wait, why aren't we doing this? And then eventually the majority will be like, hello, like, why aren't we doing this? This is a smart thing. And then um, then they'll be like, okay, fine, we can do it. <laughs> Let me just uh, take care of my kitty. Oh. Mm. I'm back. Yeah, most people um, just follow the herd. Yeah. Yeah. What do you have other um, protest songs and stuff? Do you do other activism? Um. Yeah, like the GMO stuff. I don't like GMOs, so I wrote a song called "Clap for Food Quality" because I like to keep it positive. Like it's not that I'm anti stuff. Yeah, I like to think I'm pro something. Um, I'm an intactivist. What's oh oh you mean intactivist as an in anti circumcision? Yeah, my child is not circumcised. Yay! Honestly, it's I think maybe some things I just have like a good intuition about, and like as soon as I was pregnant and realized it was a boy, I was like, I don't think her like cutting him is gonna be good like all I could think about was like mm, that doesn't sound like it's gonna like be a good thing to do for a baby so I did a bunch of research on it and was like there's like no way we're doing this so we didn't and then I sent a video to my best friend and she also didn't circumcise her child and and now I feel like it's weird because I have a mission now to like anytime I see a friend who's pregnant with a boy there's this video I don't know if you've ever seen it but it's like elephant and the uh, hospital or elephant in the waiting room or elephant in the hospital. And, and, uh, okay, I will. It's um, it, there are parts that are very graphic. I actually fast forwarded through those because I don't want to see it. But um, it, he goes over all the things. It's like thirty minutes, and he goes over all the things about why circumcision is like terrible. And so now I always am torn with like if I know someone on Facebook or even if I don't know them that well and I see they're pregnant with a boy, I'm like, should I send them the video? I mean, like. I don't know I because I, it's like it's in me to be like I want to save their son because but then I'm, I go well I don't know what anyone's doing with their child like I don't know but it's just the majority around here do that so you know I don't ever around, where's around here like well I just mean like the south like Georgia and uh you know like the majority of parents still circumcise their child um oh, yeah yeah so like I don't, they were trying they they almost passed a bill legalizing it in California a few years ago, right? Oh really? I didn't know that. Well, see, I figure in more liberal states they're probably more aware, but I just know like oh, because some places, uh, your insurance will not cover it, but in Georgia the insurance still covers it. Oh. Yeah, so that's how I know like it's still it's a still majority thing, and even like you know, um doctors and nurses will tell you all the pros for it like to parents and so I'm always torn like like ah uh, should I send this video like I don't want them to get mad at me but at the same time you know it's like torture for their son I'll, I'll like throw it in there like to the legislators sometimes oh, I, mean, I, I think there should always be choice like I'm not really for banning anything like sugar or anything but um but you know, like there's all that conversation and I, I, this might offend you. Who knows? I mean, so far we're like batting a hundred with, you know, how we feel the same way about political things. But um, I really don't like the idea of children being able to change their gender until they're like an adult, you know? Okay. Yeah. Like, I don't know what I think about it. So, so it's like, I feel like the whole circumcision thing is actually similar. It's like, well, you're basically transforming their sexual organ without their consent. That's true. And, and, and even more so because they're babies. And there's this weird like thing that's anti-intuitive. And I think, and I talk about this in Qigong a lot, because again, it's like the study. So I feel the liberty to just talk in that class as opposed to Tai Chi, where it's just like, I'm just showing movements. 
but when you do anything that's anti your own intuition, like it's so wonderful that you trusted your intuition on that um, for so many reasons. And also because when you do something anti-intuitive to yourself, it's almost like you're tying a knot in your energy system. And that'll always be there until you face what you did that was not, you know, supporting your intuition. And so, it, you know, th that knot is almost like this rock in a water that creates waves that is almost like a trauma bond with so many people around you who have made that same decision. Oh. And, and so when it comes to, you know, the circumcision that most people do and they say something like, oh, well, do it when they're a baby so there's less pain. That's actually not true. Like it's actually more pain in some ways, but everyone believes it because of that anti-intuitive knot that they've all just swallowed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, the, I read, I'm in a Facebook group, uh, something about, it. I don't remember what it's called, but it's um, for uh, anti-circumcision. And um, a lot of times it's uh, the fathers don't, you know, want like, they went through it so they think their son should and it's the same thing what you're talking about because people are always saying yeah but they were if they say that what they went through was wrong then they're negating their own trauma like so they in you in life we want to accept things that happen to us or else we 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 do accept them or else we can't accept like there'll be a problem with us not accepting them so people accept their experiences as right and good is what i'm trying to say and so it's exactly what you're saying, where everyone has swallowed this knot and it it offends people to hear the opposite. Like, may, like it offends people to question it. Yeah, it questions their very foundation. It, it feels unstable. It's like if someone on, you know, if someone's taking psychiatric drugs, which I don't judge, if they suddenly stop taking them. Yeah. Like everything gets jostled around and it's like their chemistry changes and it's the same kind of chemical difference i do have a song about it it's called expression it was gonna be on the first album painted truth but then i wanted to keep it to the 72 minute red book standard like i was originally gonna have like 16 or 17 songs but then i kept actually it does have six wait i think i was originally gonna have like 20 and that was such an important song to me but it just didn't make the cut because it didn't sound the best in the first go through but what? yeah i can sing you one of the, the verse about it <laughs> yeah because this is where I became, I became at like three years old, I became an intactivist because I experienced my brother having a bris and I oh. felt like I, I felt demons or something like I was just a very sensitive child. Oh. These men in suits would gather around my brother and I just wanted to kick them all and, and get them away from him. Like I love my brother and I felt like, how do I, save my brother from this like I heard him screaming and I just like ran to my room and like passed out I think and like started to try to help him on the spirit world or something I don't know what happened but it was it's a very strong memory of feeling like the pit of my stomach you know that danger feeling when you like feel like okay there's danger around your your temperature changes and like you get this pit in your stomach like oh my god like yeah. following me or something like I'm in danger I need to get out of here real quick yeah that was like that times a million wow so this so then I like I'm uplifting with it with my music and I'm just like I remember when my brother was born all the men gathered around while a piece of him was torn what I later was told was that he was circumcised but what I always knew was that he was traumatized I tried to tell people just how I felt try to play with the cards we've all been dealt but most think this rule's too hard to reject they think it's essential to their health or sect but I am a Jew and I think it's not true not by talking to my mom but at nocirc.com I can feed my mind and find my own expression God is listening to me. Expression <laughs> always waiting for me. <laughs> I love it. Do you have that something recorded? I might have like us performing it live at something. I can share that too with people when I send them the video, the anti circumcision video. I can send them your song too. I'll be like, oh, and listen to this. I love it. I love the lyrics. Yeah, I might have like the rough track somewhere 
like in a pro tools session i just have to find someone with pro tools so i can bounce it or something ah pro tools is that on um what is that on is that Mac. is that adobe oh no i was thinking of adobe suite and i was like is that an adobe suite thing it's is like that a whole like entity in itself ah you just pay monthly kind of like the photoshop mm -hmm. thing like but they update it constantly which i don't like because it's like updates can change things yeah and then you're like i just got used to this thing it's like let's just go back to the 12 year old with the four track yeah that's so impressive like i don't how did you even do that i know <laughs> that's what i think now like i'm thinking like why did no adults like see how impressive that was like they were just like oh this crazy kid um i have the same thing i remember like writing a song or singing a song and my mom and dad were like, I was like, how was it? You know, and they were like, it's good for your age. And I remember being like, for my age, what does that mean? Like, it's good. Oh, yeah, I was totally picked apart, like told to stop playing piano all the time. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing you didn't. Yeah. Yeah. My mom was really encouraged. She'd be like, practice, practice, practice. But... Yeah. Um, I took voice lessons and piano lessons actually sad story my voice teacher died like a week a couple of weeks ago my old voice teacher I I think about my voice teacher I'm wondering if she's still alive well I kept meaning to like get in touch with her you know just to be like hey it's been a long time how are you and I didn't and she died and then there was someone else in my life who same thing I thought about maybe reaching out to them I never did it was someone who was gonna play with me and anyway he died and so the point is you want to reach out to somebody, just do it because, like, they could die. <laughs> no. And I don't know. It's like, and because I think of people all the time who I want to reach out to, and then I always feel weird. Like, they're going to think I'm, like, like, you know, like, I, I don't know. It's like, uh, I, when I used to drink, I, I don't really drink anymore, but um, I used to drink, and I would. I would, like, write people who I was thinking about, and then later, I'd always be like, oh, my God. Like, I did that. And they're going to know I was drinking. And so I always thought it was like a drunk me thing. Like a drunk me would do this weird thing where I would message people. But then as a sober person, I realized, no, no, that is really who I am. And I just had the like lowered inhibitions while I was drinking to be like, why not do it? Whenever I'm sober, I'm like, they're just so weird for reaching out to them. And it's funny, the times that I've reached out to people like on Facebook or something and just to, like send them a quick message. And like most people respond if you haven't seen them in a long time. But when people don't respond, it is like so much like, what? I haven't talked to you in ages. Why didn't you respond? I'm like, what? I don't understand. But um, yeah, you know, I feel like it's kind of like how when bread goes stale, but like, but like it, there's a better analogy of like something just gets crust over it. And it's just like those thoughts of doubt or like the you just need to like scoop off the crust. And then you're just like, okay, I'm in the pudding. Yeah. That make I, not I don't know what the right word is, but like these are some good metaphors. I like them. It's like dust or something lands on something, and those are like your doubt, and you're just like, oh wait, let me just wipe this dust off. Yeah, uh, I well, can see clearly. I'm gonna have to remember that next time, so that way I can mentally dust it off and be like, okay, it's gone now. I'm gonna do what I want. But I think yeah. it's also kind of imposter syndrome. Yeah, because like, I, I don't know if it is exactly. But it's something like that because there's a part of me that wants to do it. And there's the other part of me that's like, no, I can't do that. Like, like I have a professor from college. I think about all the time, like, I wonder what they're doing. Like, I should write them. And then I'm like, no. And then one time I did write a professor on Facebook. I found his Facebook and I read him a long message and he never responded. And I don't even know if he got it though, because we're not friends. <laughs> and a lot of people, like, even people I'm friends with on Facebook, I'll like talk with them on the wall, but they won't respond to messages because they don't have messenger and they don't like, it's an app that you have to have. And so they just rather not be bothered. You don't see it. Like, it's true. Like you're just not paying attention. And they just like find their mailing address and write an old school level letter. I need to go back. Cause I, could, I still have message. Like I have the message somewhere. I should go back and find it and see what I wrote. But um, it was just about, like, he really influenced me during college, and it meant a lot to me. So I wanted to tell him, and um, it never responded. But like I said, he probably, hopefully he didn't get it. Hopefully he didn't just ignore it. 
Aww. And like sometimes like we think we've replied to things in our head when we haven't. I do that all the time. <laughs> I do that. It's like I have like I am the most like successful with what I want to do when I write lists. Like, okay, this is what I still need to do. Mm. I am a I want to be a list person and I say things all the time like it's on the list. And I have a mental list of things, but um, I'm really bad at actually writing it down. Or like even more effective for me is like sitting down for five minutes a day and visualizing everything I want to do that day, that week, and just like experiencing me actually doing it in my mind. Oh, and that helps. Do you oh just- yeah, that, that's what really helps with the testifying because testifying is like parting the Red Sea. You know, it's like, it just seems impossible. You walk through the door and you don't know what to expect. There's no rules to the game. It constantly changes. And so, like, I just, like, write down a bunch of legislators that I want to talk to. And literally, they'll appear, like, in the elevator next to me or something. And I'll be like, I want to talk to you. Wow. So how, how do you end up at these places? Do you just, how do you do that? Like, do you just get on a list and say, I want to go talk at the meeting or... How does that work? Well, the Georgia session is 40 days and it has a bunch of committees. So to make a law, you've got the Senate and the House, but you also have all these committees that it has to go through to filter before it gets to the floor for a vote. And so you sign up to be on the email list of these committees that you think um, legislations that you care about will be there. If you watch my first live video this year, I go through the rundown. Oh, like, okay. It's I say like, what are the cannabis bills? And like, it's just, it, I have a hemp news playlist on my channel. And so my first live, I was like, let's do this together. And I shared the screen. Um, I might not have shared the screen for that one, but I might've, anyway, I think there's five or six lives. And you go and you just literally Google cannabis in the legislation, legis.georgia.gov, ga.gov search legislation cannabis it'll bring up all the possible hemp legislation and if it was read and referred to a committee it will say okay it's in this committee you click on the committee you write to the chair you say please add me to the email list and notify me of your meetings then you get email lists that you have to check and then it'll tell you the agenda and your bill if your bill is on the agenda then you can just show up and sign up to speak that's wow. that's it's weird because it's complicated but simple at the same time and it's not guaranteed that you can speak, mm. but you know, you know, you're going that day to the meeting. So I write all these different people that I think I want to meet while I'm there. And if I can't talk, you know, you know, sure, I'm going to that there's a meeting in the house this day, but I know that these senators are going to be getting that bill. So I want to talk to them about it too. So who's the chairman of the agricultural committee in the Senate? Let me make sure I try to talk to them or at least, you know, the sponsor of the bill and, you know, but the thing is, is like, we don't have a dog in the fight when it comes to writing legislation. So it's really just about education when I go down there or entertainment to kind of shake some sense into them and maybe the rest of the world if you know anyone decides to watch it. Oh, okay. Wow. And you brought Scribbles? Oh yeah, Scribbles is, they asked to hear from Scribbles. Oh. I'm so famous than my mommy. How long has Scribbles been around? It's when a baby. Um, I said, it's not a competition, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Okay, fine, it's true. Um, he's been around, I mean, I wrote Cannabis Car before he was around, and I didn't really start testifying until, like, maybe 2016 or 2017, and I think he was around during that time. Like he started coming to me, coming with me um, to the different hemp festivals that we would travel around to, like Colorado and Tennessee. We got involved in this organization called Hemp History Week. And so we met a bunch of people doing incredible things through that. And like Ellie, for example, created his hemp eyes. Yeah. So he has hemp paper eyes. Um, oh missing one which is symbolic because only hemp is free federally not the other part of cannabis uh-huh. i think all of cannabis needs to be free in order 
for cannabis to be free because um i don't you know to to breed hemp for fuel you can't have thc limitations i think that was probably one percent thc um there just needs to be no limitations on the amazing plant yeah it's kind of silly but then how is it that some people in atlanta have their their like weed card so that started this year. You and starting in June, you get um, medical is legal. Medical oh, yeah. is legal exactly. for a while. It just hasn't been legal to buy it in Georgia. That's well, right. I, I think it's all an illusion. But um, mm. so there's, I did like a short video on that too. Um, what was that noise? Something just fell. I'm wondering if Kitty Cat is like. Yeah, she's exploring. She's being very explorative. She's exploring all kinds of new corners. Um, what was I just saying? Um, you did a video on it. I was asking about medical weed. Oh yeah, yeah. I did a short video on how they were going to add um, dysmenorrhea. Oh, which, which nobody knew what it was. Not even the sponsor. <laughs> and it's period pain. Oh, hey that's a good one dad yeah I'm funny short about it but then it never ended up passing oh uh, it's just that's it's just so stupid it's like there shouldn't be limitations like use it for what you want it's not a big deal it really uh, but officially there's like a list and it you can it could only be oil it can't be anything else that's the only thing that's allowed and um yeah they'll be selling it starting in june about and it's there's a list of conditions you can find it. Wow. You know, so I, I thought it already was legal. Like, because I remember seeing people with a pen and I thought they said that was their weed pen. So maybe they just had it. And I I thought it was legal like a few years ago. I mean, I'm... Everyone that I know who wants to smoke smokes. Like, nobody holds back. Like, yeah, no one does. It's all an illusion. Like, but hemp, d8 is being sold now like it's just that they're getting it like from their dealer or something they're just not able to buy it in the store so legality means like okay it's regulated you could buy it in the store it's taxed whatever um so d8 is a flower it, it's you know delta eight okay yeah similar to delta nine but it's not on any control sub substance list they're trying to change that now and you and it's in hemp so they've been making Delta 8 products, which basically gets you high in a very similar way. And so that's been, quote unquote, legal. Yeah, we have some shops around here. Well, um, I say that, but actually, so I live technically in Georgia, but I live near Tennessee. And so the one here in Georgia near us, they apparently close because the police are like always, you know, get on to them. The Alpine dispensary? Um, no, it's, I forget what it's called. Um, I mean, there's, there's probably more than one. There's just one in particular that's near us. That's, uh, they were closing because of all the like police, whatever. And, um, but they have other stores and like in Tennessee over the line, uh, and they're not bothering them. Like they don't get bothered there. Um, but they sell Delta eight, Delta nine, Delta 10, all of those. I don't know the differences, well, but my other sponsor, um, for 420 tomorrow, um, mellow bear honey mm. they do d8 honey and they're helping a lot of people like with pain relief and yeah and like dizziness and nausea and stuff i may have had i don't know what it was but it was uh, i thought it was just hemp but it had thc in it and it was honey and um was it? i didn't know that you weren't supposed to take the whole stick and i took the whole stick and I woke up with like my hands numb. Anyway, it wasn't a good experience, but that's only because I totally took, I just assumed like it's a honey stick. You can't reclose it. So I thought one serving was one stick. And then later I looked at it and it said five servings. Like this was five servings. So um, I gave the rest to my partner who ate them and it didn't bother him one bit. Like he did a whole <laughs> stick of it. It didn't, it didn't matter to him. Like it doesn't affect him like it does me. But Wait, um, see, we're the same. We're the same. I was like, it affected me greatly. Like it, I was having numb hands, numb, numb feet, tingly everywhere. And like, I was panicking, 
but um it was just the amount like i don't and also i never could smoke weed because um it makes me panic like i know a lot of people will do it and like it's so cool totally cool everyone does it i don't care but it just doesn't work like i just get panicky okay so here's something really interesting that i believe is that because the plant's being torn apart and this is my metaphor is the baby the king solomon with the baby the two moms who were like he was like well i'll cut the baby in half and you can each have half and one of the moms was like okay and the other one was like no give it to her i just want the baby to live and he's like okay you're the real mom i'm giving you the baby and that's how i feel like that's what happened with the cannabis plant they cut it in two and so what's happened is that the market for thc is like oh let's just make it real high and so it actually lowers the cbd and i'll tell you more about what that cannabidiol does, it actually regulates how the THC affects you. Interesting. So, like isolate, this is what's really interesting is like legally the FDA recently, and this is why they're attacking this, the store possibly, is, is they said, you can't put isolates in food. It has to be whole plant, which I think is pretty wise because it is going to be healthier in a way, but a lot of people are making money just harvesting these isolates, like just the D8, you know, just this or that. Um, it's like Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> like we got to put all the pieces together somehow. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a very interesting metaphor. And you know what also is weird? Um, I'm reading a book series. It's like a fantasy book series. And uh, that she totally did that. Um, there was a part in the book where there's a mother there's two mothers and they're fighting over a baby and she does that thing and then at one point she gets it was in the bible and i was like i don't remember that and now that you said it i was like oh solomon right okay but that's so funny because i just read that like two nights ago so that's awesome is it a recent fantasy novel um well no it's it's so i don't know what the whole series is called but the first one is called fortuna like fortune with an a fortuna uh sworn sworn i think sworn it's her name and it's about it's like in the fairy world um and i think there's five books and what's the most interesting part is i think it was self-published which but she had a bunch of other books that were like um like great hits so she's a great author but i think she self-published this book which i was kind of surprising because usually self-published are not as well uh not as I don't know, fast paced, like this one was super fast paced. Anyway, but yeah, it's it's interesting. It's, it's fairies. I read all kinds of stuff. I don't just read fairy stuff, but I read fairy stuff. That's so crazy. Someone just gave me a plant um and I named her fairy. Oh funny. Today. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I love it. Um, does she look like a fairy? She is um an amarillo, is that how you say it? I don't know. It's like a yellow flower. Yeah, I was like, that's yellow. I might be saying it wrong. It's something like I mean, I think you're saying you're saying yellow, right? But um oh, yeah. <laughs> um I mean Amarillo Amarillo. We're Amarillo, really, if we're gonna do the double L's. I love this cat so much. It's crazy. I don't know. She's the cutest oh. thing. Like she's so little um you know what i i haven't asked you and i can't let you go until i ask you i haven't even asked you about your band oh yeah we could talk as long as you want um oh, okay i was like i know i said an hour so if you need to go that's totally cool um or we can chat a little bit more whichever you need to do yeah, um i love playing with a band so much they've been so incredible they've taught me so much and i just feel so blessed like i just remember going to a bunch of open mics and just doing my thing and then people would come up to me and be like hey do you want to play with me you know like you want to jam and like eventually like the flying penguins came together or I would go up to other people and be like hey like do you think you would sing with me and then like it might take a little while gotta have patience and then we just all ended up coming together and you know there are some that come in and out but my drummer has been with me um, not since the beginning. I think I went through a couple of drummers before him. Um, and yeah, so it's been really fun collaborating with all kinds of musicians and 
I guess I'm the, I, it's really like my band and I hire the musicians to play with me, but it is really like, there's been like years where it would be the same people at once. And that's my favorite because you just create this organic chemistry and then people get married or whatnot and then they they might come back or who knows, so. Yeah, it becomes like a family. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, I saw um that you won some award in 2017 for your Painted Truth. Yeah, you know, I submitted that to a contest and it won Best Folk Album and they like, invited me to this big event in LA and like I didn't even know if I was gonna win and then they called me on the stage and it was like epic you know <laughs> that's so awesome yeah that's really cool um yeah I listened to some of it I really liked it I like the uh, the folky sound thank you yeah and like the thing is it's like I learned this from Ani DeFranco it's like because she calls her music folk it's not like even a musical style per se it's the fact that it's for folk it's for people so the message i'm saying is not um digitized it's not corporatized it's not commercialized it's like my voice people's voice and so that's what they said in like the award when they announced it on stage they were like folk comes in a lot of different forms this even has some poppy flavors like you know there are some pop like you know hold on She's getting into trouble. What are you doing, Kate? What are you doing? You get to me. to meet Brooke. Are you ready? Hi, her. Oh my goodness. She took one look at me and was like, get me out of here. No, she doesn't want me to hold her. Aww. It wasn't you at all. Like, she was fighting me the whole way. Here. Oh, <laughs> she's my baby. What's huh? her name? What's Tiger her name? Tiger 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 Lily. Lily. Oh, that's pretty. That's a pretty name for a kitty. Um, why, there was something I was going to say when you went away. Um, and I, I forgot what it was. Talking about the penguins and um, yes, the band and people getting married. I can't think of it. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what it was. That gum it. I'm was, sorry. No, no. no I, if it wasn't even related, or if it was just some other thought I had, it's okay. That happens. Drummer, or you said like you were watching a video. Of the band, maybe. Um, I got a few. Oh yes, I wrote it down. Thanks. Um, I I thought you did remind me kind of Ani DeFranco. Um, I I I didn't know if you would take that as a compliment or not, so I didn't say it. But I, yeah, I, I told my partner that I was like, yeah, it's kind of like Ani DeFranco. Um, so so it's funny that you mentioned her because that's I was totally getting that vibe. Yeah, I mean, I've reached out to her because she has a record label, you know, and I'm like, hey, you want to do, you know. But I never heard back. I mean, probably never got the message. Oh, oh yeah. That's what I was going to say. I think like a couple years ago, back when I lived in uh, Atlanta, I had posted a video of me singing or something, and you had asked if I wanted to come jam, and I, I didn't. And I, was I gonna, thought that was you. I I think I was going to tell you, I think I, I, I chickened out. I'm sorry. I was like, I felt like a, like a fraud. I was like, I'm not a real musician. And so I was like, I can't do it. I can't. I'm too nervous. So I I'm think, sorry. I think you were like saying something like you're shy, and I was like, "Well, let's get you out of your comfort zone." I'm nervous about um. Well, I don't have a keyboard anymore. I I used to. I think I probably had a keyboard at that time, but I don't anymore. Um. So I didn't have any a different instrument either, and I have a ukulele, but it's out of tune, and I'm I don't remember how to play it at all. Um, so I think I was just too nervous that I wasn't going to live up to a good standard. So I just was like, no, I'm sorry. So anyway, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. And like, I've like jammed with people who have never sang before. Like, like I do like emotional release work with people. This one girl I was working with, like she, I witnessed her writing her first song and singing over this 
And then like the next year she won like creative loafings, like best new, one of the best new artists. <laughs> like you never wow. know what that's gonna happen when you like just open up to your talent. That's easy. Gifts. It's not like yeah, I've been there too. Like it's constantly a battle of like, am I good enough and all kinds of different things. But we just have to keep on lifting each other up. Like just, you know, being interviewed by you lifts me up. Oh good. I'm glad. Yeah. Um I think I, I was listening to another one of your videos and um you mentioned that you did breath therapy. Um and I was wondering if that so when I was in college we ha is that related to Catherine Fitzmorris and her breath work? Maybe. So we had someone come who was with her, like her son or someone, or maybe it was her. I don't remember. But anyway, we did a lot of breath work where like emotional release. I didn't do it though, because uh, I, like you would get on this ball and she would like push you and prod you in places. And then people would have like an emotional, like usually like they'd start crying or they'd start yelling or anything. And um, someone tried to get me to do it, but I chickened out. I'm such a chicken sometimes. I mean, I, Actually, I think I was hungover too. So, because I was, that was a college I was drinking a lot. And so I felt like I couldn't do it hungover. I was like really afraid of like, I don't know, getting too dizzy or something. I, I, but, I and, yeah, I, I didn't do it. But I, I was just curious if that's the similar type of stuff that you do. I think so. I mean, I never, like, did you try um, in that class? Did you try to do any like grunting or any kind of emotional releasing? Never. I'm Maybe I just know I didn't do the main one, which is like the one where everyone freaks out. But we did do a lot of like, um, like different sounds and like, well, we gave each other massages to loosen each other up and stuff like that. Huh. Uh, well, like I, remember, Can I just feed her really, really quickly. I'm just gonna. Put her down. No, just because she's like really being rambunctious. Hold on. Are you hungry, baby? Oh, yeah. So Leonard Orr is one of the names I remember. Um, some people were studying at Harvard. They were actually combining the holotropic breathing experience with their clients with um, LSD. And oh. it was almost like people would have trips into their inner child world to That's release some of the traumas. Um, I've never done that. <laughs> But, yeah, so my teacher um, was Carol Lampman. Okay. He was, it was a wonderful, uh, like a 10 day, very in, insular experience where you were camping out in Arizona or you had a bunk or something. And so it was like a, a deep dive into your own psyche and also learning how to be a therapist. Wow. So what do you do during your breath therapy work? So if I were a practicing breath therapist, which I'm not, I kind of um, add it to my music lessons sometimes, if people are interested to do that emotional release to access their gifts. Um, but a normal session, like if you were gonna go see someone, you would lie down um, in the beginning and do the holotropic breathing until you were brought to a state, an unmasked state, so to speak, where you're no longer in your mind, you're in your breath and your body where you can feel emotions. And then you kind of, it's kind of like layers of the onion, like you start to feel something intensely and you start to kind of focus on that memory and dive into it. And, you know, like, what do you smell? What do you see? Like, how do you feel? And you feel through it because at the time you couldn't for some reason, like you had to bottle it up. You had to be quiet 
were too scared. You didn't have the support. You didn't have someone like the therapist who could like be like, you're, you're a beautiful baby girl. You don't deserve this. You know, like tell, tell, tell me how you're feeling or, you know, there's a lot of different techniques that therapists can use um, to just be that love that the loving parent that you needed at the time or, or an angel. And you just go through it and um, there's different techniques, you know, for the, you just, just allow the person to, to feel whatever they're feeling. A lot of times anger can come up and that's when you can give them like a plastic bat and they, there's a certain position you do to hit the pillows or punch the pillows in a safe way. Like there's all these different techniques on getting anger out. They have break rooms I hear now, which is like a thing. Wow. You go yeah. break up for your anger. Hey, it's a start. Mm -hmm. um, temper tantrum position. We used to do that in my live classes for Qigong. They, my students loved that. A lot of elderly women, they were like, I want to do the temper tantrum because there's just not a lot of place for anger release in this culture. And it gets out so many toxins, like crying. It gets out like 38 toxins. But if you cry from an onion, it gets out like four. Really? That's interesting. I, I'm a crier. I, I cry more than I get angry. I cry for everything. <laughs> that's, that's typical of women. Like women, because society accepts our tears more than our anger. And that's with men, society accepts their anger more than their tears. So usually that's their go-to emotional expression. That makes sense. That's why like a lot of men have anger issues. Or And like... I'm in a bunch of different mom groups and stuff. And I can tell you there's so many posts and it's always like, like I'm in a gentle parenting group too. And it's always the dad who's like got anger problems. Like it's so many. So, so yes. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm like, it's always, it's always the man with the anger. Um, just, I, and I think that's just something that like, yeah, we were, we well, not like we teach men to be angry, but like you said, the anger is accepted, so that's how they um, emote. Could and also be circumcision, but yeah. like like when we express our anger in breath therapy or primal therapy, a lot of times what's behind it is the tears. It's like the layers, so it's like you got to express the anger. Sometimes the anger was like masking your tears, so once you express it, you can cry. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Well, that's really cool. Um, we did, um, we did breath therapy in school, and we had to do a um, we had to like do a a, a performance. Can't think of the word performance of our how our voice came to be. Like so, um, everyone's was different, but like there, mine was like little vignettes of things that have happened in my life that made me like my voice so I am anyway and my teacher told me I should make that into a one-woman show and I was, she told me that and I'm like or she said something like it's I need to keep flesh it out or you know something like that and that I'm like so cool like I was in the primal theater group in New York before I moved here <laughs> and that's all it was all the performances were people doing primal therapy oh wow um my problem is, is I've, I've thought about doing that, but now it's like, I don't remember it. Like, I, I don't remember what I did. So it's like, oh, dang it. That was 10 years ago. I was like, ah, I should have done, I should have done it after college. I should have been like, yeah, I'm going to go make this right now into a one-woman show. You could do another one. We, I've always felt like we needed that in the South. There's no primal theater here. Like, um, that's how I first got into it this, before Carol Lampman, I I took classes from this guy in New York at the Primal Theater. And uh, I'm, I don't know why I'm spacing on his name. I feel like it was Alec. Oh my God. He's like one of the most amazing influences on my life. And I don't even remember his name, but it was like so long ago. But um, yeah. And I, I was like, are there any primal therapists who get primal theater people in Georgia? And he was like, no, but there's a primal therapist. Then I, so then I just started going to one-on-one -on -one therapy, but I was like, why don't you start a theater group? And she's like, no, I'm not a theater person. <laughs> well, I would do it. I'm not in Atlanta currently, but um, I would do a primal theater. That sounds fun. Yeah, that would be super fun, like, to somehow do it. Yeah, it sounds like, so my partner is always telling me that I seem more like an experimental theater person. Um, 
I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but you know what? I think, I mean, I am kind of, I, and I never found any experimental theater in the like. I know they have it though, because other people I've known have done it. But like, you know, it's kind of like experimental theater too, I would think. I would totally be down to do something like that with you. Awesome. Well, maybe we'll have to, maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll have to figure something out. Yeah, I think we do. I think people need it. And I, and I think it'd be good for my soul. Yeah to express oh, myself cool. like that i mean it could even be part of a music video yeah. that'd be cool well, I what kind of do it in my love unspoken music video i do a little bit of primal screaming and stuff oh okay i don't think i saw that one <laughs> <laughs> i think i would remember i don't i didn't see that one well cool after this then we should definitely talk about doing something like that that'd be great mm -hmm. um what do you have planned next well i've got those three shows tomorrow Mm -hmm. um, and I'm working on some music videos and I recorded a couple of tracks in Tennessee that I'm mixing and we've been working, the band's been working on Key of You for 10 years since Pain of Truth, uh, the studio closed. And so we haven't really been working on it. Like we worked on it for like three years or so, and then the studio closed. So it's just kind of like in a Pro Tools hard drive. And I'm just like, I just have to finish like just a few more things in each song. So pray for us, but that's, that'll be really exciting. We did release one song from it, Colorado in July and Hemp Revival is on that one. So that's maybe it's supposed to be released when cannabis is freed or something like that. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe one will spark the other. But yeah, a lot of exciting things. Like, I feel like I've just been doing a lot of things on YouTube and collabing with people. Like, I did an EDM track with Sarah Higdon. We just had fun with it. Oh, um, that's fun. An activist. She's a, she's a trans activist who um, is conservative. So she's Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, she's very interesting. Very um, heart-minded. Heart and... Um, yeah so just a lot of exciting fun possibilities are in the air scribbles is working on his cartoon you know scribbles soup was the last official production that we released a couple of years ago and i sing the song Gasoline. La, 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 la. and yeah so i painted a lot of paintings for that and never released the book because I submitted it to a bunch of publishers who were like no 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 so I haven't bitten off the self-publishing thing yet uh, but that might happen and in the meanwhile I'm working on uh, some music videos for that some cartoons with some people well, that's cool is your is the book done your children's book yeah it's done but yeah it's not published mm -hmm. well, there's got to be more publishers out there I, I mean you could do self-publishing but I feel like the problem with self-publishing is that you have to do all of your own, like, you know, uh, marketing, like, and cause, and you already know as a musician, you, you are in charge of yeah, finding your audience. So I feel like I don't want, like I'm a writer and I've not like written anything to get published, but like, I don't want to self-publish because I want someone else for once to do it. I want someone <laughs> to find the audience to say, Hey, look at this, read this. Like I, I have to do it too so that's the problem with self-publishing and plus it's like because then you have to get people to read it and it's like hard to get people to read something that is coming from you and not like a publishing company so anyway i'm sure there's got to be other publishers how, how many did you try a lot but oh, the thing is, is I, there i know there's a way i can release it as an audio book oh yeah because we do the stories in the book, in the CD and the songs. Oh, okay. So I've got to, if once I release it as an audio book, maybe it'll get a bunch of, you know, downloads and maybe that'll give me the money to self-publish. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, wait, you'll figure it out. Yeah, one day at a time. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on here and talking to me. It's been amazing talking to you. <laughs> Oh, this has been great. Was there anything else you wanted to say before we go or anything? No, can't think of anything. Okay, <laughs> just checking. <laughs>
All righty. Well, I'll let you get back to your night, but thank you so much. And um, we'll talk more about doing some primal theater. That sounds awesome. Awesome. Well, Bye. Have a good night, too. <laughs> you too. Bye. Bye.